In Money Watch this week, a relatively flat day on Wall Street, but overall good news. The Dow ticking up about 110 points. Meanwhile, the S&P 500 and NASDAQ were flat. Joining us is J.D. Durkin and Javier David. Uh, J.D. is the host of financial news website The Street. And Javier is a CBS News contributor and managing editor, editor for business and markets at Axios. Both of you I can call friends of the network, friends of the show. Friends of because us. I like you it. Share <laughs> your friends inside. territory. Thank yes, you. so like well with us <laughs> uh, each and every week. <laughs> friend zone. Okay with that. I like that. JD, let's start, let's start with you because uh, the big story this week, of course, inflation hitting 3%, lowest point in two years. Have we reached a turning point in your view? Perhaps a little too soon to tell. This is, yeah. listen, this is a lot of reason for optimism, right? We know the central bank has been very clearly communicating now for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Inflation is too deeply entrenched as of late, specifically in the services sector of the economy. A bit of, of easing of pressure on goods, but we still need to do a better job to get back down uh, to 2%. So I think the market participants right now are betting come July 26th, a couple of uh, weeks from now, for the next central bank meeting, that's about a 96% chance, according to market participants, hmm. we rode back to another rate hike after a recent pause. The Fed has said we probably need to do quite a bit more work, maybe two more rate hikes between now and the end of the year yeah. to be more confident that inflation is heading in the right direction. All right, going to bring Javier into this conversation. So that target number 2% goal for inflation, uh, we're still not there yet, but we're headed in the right direction. What needs to happen in order for us to reach that number? Honestly, consumers probably need to stop spending. Um, I think one of the takeaways from today's bank earnings is that um, consumer spending is healthy. Uh, all of the major banks um, beat market expectations. Uh, we have um, an inflation print that's moving in the right direction, as JD said. We, you know, still too soon to tell, but and we've had a number of head fakes in the past. We don't want to get too optimistic, but you know, the bottom line of it is. Uh, we may actually see a two-handle on the next CPI print if things go according to plan. The one that we saw just this week was better than expected. It was 3%. It's not inconceivable to think that we could be at 2.9 or 2.8, which is moving us slightly yeah. closer to the Fed self-imposed target. So, you know, things are looking increasingly possible, and it's why stocks are flying and the dollar, which is one of my favorite indicators, is tanking. And the dollar is pricing is telling us that in large measure – the market is pricing in the idea of a soft landing. Yeah. Mm. Do your part for the economy. Stop spending, consumers. <laughs> All right. J.D., big banks uh, showed major profits in their Q2 earnings report released today. What does that tell you about the state of the economy? I mean, big profits indeed. Remember the phrase, too big to fail? Yeah, yeah. It's a little bit that. of a triggering phrase back from 2008. It seems like the banks that have been too big to fail are somehow even just bigger. 67% year-over-year profit for J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, 57%. I want to be careful not to paint all of the so-called big banks with a broad brush. It's a little bit of a different picture for Citigroup. But as we've seen smaller and regional banks, and that's really going to be the tell as they report next week and the following week, as we've seen them really struggle in this current high interest rate environment. We've seen the big banks there to catch up all these consumers that have had this so-called mm -hmm. kind of flight to safety. It's important to note, we always listen to what uh, J.P. Morgan uh, Chase Chief Jamie Dimon says very closely. He says, we're not out of the weeds entirely for a so-called recession. We could still hit it. It could be, uh, albeit a bit of a mild one, but we did learn that these banks relatively are healthy. But to Javier's point and yours as well, Lana, consumers are still spending. What's fascinating to me is you watch these consumer sentiment surveys where we ask Americans, especially American voters in the lens of politics, how are you feeling about the economy? And they oftentimes say, I don't feel great right. about it. The problem is they're not spending as if they feel that bad about right. it right now. They're still now. spending money. <laughs> they regardless. absolutely are. Right. You know, it also strikes me, um, Javier, was just, just what, a few months ago, um, we had that banking crisis in, in Northern California. I was out there in San Jose covering the collapse of SVB. And I saw earlier this week, Bank of America paid a major fine for kind of like doing a mini Wells Fargo. It was creating accounts. It was uh, double charging people overdraft fees. So where are we as far as the health of our banking sector? You know, JD says, look, things are pretty strong. Banks are making tons of money. But what's what's the real deal? The real deal is I think that the banking crisis that we had in the spring was very isolated. And I think that much of what we saw happen with SBB and a couple of these other names, most of which were concentrated on the West Coast, 
um, was kind of idiosyncratic in that it wasn't endemic to the banking sector. There was a lot of fear. There was a lot of uncertainty, a lot of dramatic market moves. And the market has a tendency to sort of overreact to certain things. And that's what I think we saw. We saw a lot of fear. We saw a lot of people basically kind of like stuffing cash under their mattresses, for lack of a better term. Um, but you saw, as JD pointed out, some of these banking institutions got bigger because there was so much turmoil and so much fear um, that, in fact, people that absorbed some of these failed banks ended up getting bigger. And we have uh, an entire uh, federal apparatus that is you know, designed to stress test the banks. Um, and each of these banks, in a lot of measures, have uh, you know emerged with flying colors. So I think it tells us that the banking sector as a whole really in isn't in as much jeopardy as we thought several months ago. Yeah. You know, I think it's interesting. I think that there's a conventional wisdom that when the economy is doing bad, when consumer sentiment is down, that people save money. But but that's not how we operate anymore. It's shop therapy when we feel bad. Uh, one of the things that people are buying a lot of, it's travel. I want to ask you guys about something called skip lagging. That's when flyers don't get on their connecting flight. They stay in the city that they have a layover. They're like, why would they do that? Here's hack. why. It's sometimes cheaper than, yeah. than booking a nonstop flight. So, uh, Javier, I'm going to throw this over to you. Do you think it's fair that airlines have now been cracking down on skip laggers, canceling people's tickets? Or, you know, if you figured out a way to get a cheaper ticket, good on you. Yeah, you know, the airlines are not in anybody's sort of favorite list these days. <laughs> they all the traveling that people are doing, the airlines continue to have delays. Um, they continue to find ways to extract money out of passengers. It's actually interesting, like some of the, I fly a lot between New York and Miami, and one of the airlines that I use most frequently is Southwest, and it's become almost impossible for me to get a direct flight hmm. from New York City to South Florida, which you, as you imagine, one of the busiest routes in the nation. And it's it's almost impossible on that particular airline. So I think that people are well within their rights to try and save themselves a little bit of money. Um, well within their rights, if you're gonna get delayed somewhere, you know, you don't wanna end up in Timbuktu. You wanna, you'd rather like be able to control where you're going um, and maybe even see a friend or two in the process or another family member that you haven't seen in a while. But I think it's, wholly um you know appropriate for people to do these things and certainly the airlines shouldn't be trying to crack down on them well uh jd javier david great to have you both to speak with us about markets today thank you very much for your time thank you still to come on money watch this week some restaurants are billing extra for bread and water well we're going to take a look at why some eateries are adding in these hidden fees and what you could potentially do about it you're streaming cbs news always on well, if you're at a restaurant and you've noticed an extra fee on your bill, you're not alone. That's right. According to a survey from the National Restaurant Association, roughly one in six restaurants say they're adding surcharges to combat higher costs they're experiencing. And some places are also charging extra for bread and water. No! What is this about? CBS News Money Watch reporter Megan Cerullo joins us now in Studio 57. She recently wrote this article um, about this trend and can speak to us about what you've discovered. Okay, so Megan, obviously Lana and myself, not happy to hear this. <laughs> so many questions. Um, and it stemmed from people being upset at an L LA restaurant that was charging this extra fee. What's going on here? Folks who have dined out lately or dined out regularly have likely begun to notice these surcharges tacked onto the bottom of their bills. A, a, a prominent podcaster tweeted after dining at a restaurant in Los Angeles that he was upset that that the restaurant had tacked on a 4% surcharge to the bottom of his bill. 4%, and that's sizable. 4% is significant. And there was a disclaimer that, that said, we're charging this additional amount so that we can pay our um, for our workers' uh, health insurance. And I want to note that, that this restaurant... Um, said that they're not alone and also that they're not required to pay for workers health insurance because they have fewer than 25 employees that this was a choice they're making I importantly um consumers if they read the fine print have the option to to opt out of that charge but that's mm. what um uh brought this up mm. that's interesting it's also um that seems like a, a noble 
uh, idea to try and give people health care. Um, but we've, we've reported before, we've talked to you before about are these extra tips and surcharges actually making their way to the right. workers? Um, I'm wondering, do you have any information on that? Do we, do we know, is this going to become, I'm just wondering really, is this going to become like airlines where all these fees become normal, but it really goes into the bottom line of the company? We all know that the restaurant industry operates on thin margins. It's a tough business for both operators and, and of course, workers. I, I do want to note that not all restaurants are, are bad actors. It's easy, it's easy as, a, as a consumer, as a diner, as a patron to say, well, why should I pay for their, their health insurance? Shouldn't the restaurant be paying their workers a fair wage? But the alternative for, for restaurants is to hike menu prices, which can discourage or turn away consumers. And, and restaurants are terrified of of doing that um, for fear that it'll it'll ruin their business um, on the other side consumers say and, and consumer advocates say well well this is um, this is not fair because the way diners sometimes make decisions about whether they're going to eat in an establishment is by looking at menu prices that's how they gauge a cost of the meal right. and these can sometimes fall under the that that bucket of um, people can view them as, as as sort of junk fees or these these yeah. added costs that we've all been been um, railing against sa saddled with yeah you go to a hotel and there's a destination fee and you don't even know what these things mean well, restaurants will sometimes have a certain surcharge um, if you have a party bigger than six, right, to make sure they get their tips for their workers. But these all seem optional. Um, as you said, people may not even realize that. So how can consumers and customers protect themselves from being embarrassed when the check comes um, ahead of time? First of all, restaurants are required to, to make this disclosure, okay. um, to, to indicate, to, to print on a menu or, or a guest check that... Uh, the surcharge has been added. And consumers should know that in many cases they're protected and they can opt out if they can't afford it or they simply don't feel compelled to contribute to workers' health plans, for example. So that is an option. And I do want to note, too, that um, a lot of folks were um, inclined to be extra generous during the pandemic when restaurant workers, both in the front of house and back of house, were viewed as as risking their lives mm -hmm. to uh, to feed us all. And... Um, those kinds of surcharges or suggested tips or donations have stuck around even as it's become a much safer uh, work environment. So that is also irking um, uh, some consumers. Yeah. You know, I'm wondering also with all those, with, uh, those additional surcharges, I worry about them coming out of the tips. If people were going to tip 20%, now they go down to 18, or they were gonna tip 25%, now they're down to 15%. All of that has a potential then to also hurt those workers. All right, Megan Cerullo, we'll have to see how it all turns out. Thanks for bringing it to us, though. Thanks so much. Well, still to come on Money Watch this week, it is never too early to prepare for the holidays, says some people. Well, we're going to preview toy manufacturers' most anticipated products of the year. Very cool. And more restaurants are looking to automate their food production. We'll take a look at how one New Jersey pizzeria is making more than 4,000 pies per week. You're streaming CBS News. All right, uh, some of the more obsessed might say that it's never too early to prepare for holiday shopping, specifically if you're a toy manufacturer. Well, we disagree that anybody <laughs> should be shopping for holiday toys in the summertime, but for the people who are looking to stock their stores, well, Bradley Blackburn got a preview of what is going to be happening on the holiday shelves and what might make the best gifts. If Christmas was in July, it would look something like the sweet sweet. Toy Insider's preview of this year's new goodies. Are we going to play? Yeah! With pint-sized influencers invited to try them out. Jeez. Kira and Cam are YouTube stars from Missouri. Their family vlogs and reviews toys. Today, field testing the new Skyfire Target drone. That was cool. I really like that drone. It'll launch up in the air. Toy Insider's Lori Schacht says it's one of this year's highlights with lots of tech toys in the pipeline. We can play with him just by petting him. The doggy robot can teach kids programming. 
while the Kai lets them interact with artificial intelligence. They're going to grow up with it. They need to understand it. And this is a great beginning for them. And a little secret is that these days, a lot of toys are bought by grown-ups for grown-ups. It's toys that not only are great for kids, but are great for parents too. So you see everyone playing together, and some of those toys are really geared for the 14, 18, 21 and up. That's why the biggest toy of the year could be Barbie. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Ken. Boosted by this summer's movie, she's a blockbuster with new versions for young children and adult collectors. I think that everyone is touched by Barbie in some way or another. Old favorites and new finds that could soon be on kids' holiday wish lists. Bradley Blackburn, CBS News, New York. We're told that the next slice of pizza you eat could be made by a robot. But is it an Italian robot? CBS News' Michael George takes us inside the kitchen at that New Jersey pizza shop. This isn't the way grandma used to make pizza. This slice is being made by machines. We use a dough press to help us create uniform 16-inch pies, and then we feed the dough through a piece of robotics equipment that helps us sauce and cheese the pies in a very consistent manner. Matt Basile owns Pizza HQ in Woodland Park, New Jersey. They've automated almost every part of the pizza assembly line here and can make lots of pizza fast. We do around 4,000 pies a week. They serve local customers, but they're not trying to replace the neighborhood spot. Pizza HQ's main business comes from schools and large events. It allows for consistency, which whether you're in the retail market or the wholesale market, that's what the end customer wants. More restaurants are using robots. White Castle is testing a robot that can work the fryer. McDonald's built a test restaurant in Texas where drive through customers pick up orders from a conveyor system. And during the pandemic worker shortages, many restaurants purchase robots to help deliver food. CNET's Bridget Carey expects the food industry will continue to adopt this type of technology. I think as restaurants kind of find ways where robots can help assist, make that experience better, that's where consumers are going to weigh in how they feel about it. Often top of mind for customers, how does it taste? That's great. Yeah. I'm a little surprised. That's generally the reaction that we get once you know how it's made. A slice of the future already rising in some restaurants. Michael George, CBS News, Woodland Park, New Jersey. <laughs> this is a major development. Mexico has surpassed China as the U.S.'s top trading partner, which signals a major shift in the dynamics of the global economy. Our colleague Anne-Marie Green spoke with a reporter earlier today about the significance of this change. So, I'm Canadian, and one of our things we used to always sort of brag about is we used to say, well, we're America's number one trading partner. Clearly, that went out the window a long time ago. Um, so, not only is Canada no longer the number one trading partner, neither is China. How significant is it that Mexico has replaced both, both those countries? Funny fact, I'm Canadian too, and I remember <laughs> that bragging myself. Um, but it is significant in the sense that, well, you know, some of the uh, commodities and products traded between Canada and China, I, I mean, uh, Canada and the U.S. versus the U.S. and Mexico differ a little, but it's substantial in the sense that uh, the border between the U.S. and Mexico, there's a lot of manufacturing partnerships there that keep uh, about 5 million U.S. jobs uh, in the country. And so it's not just about the trade relationship between Mexico and the U.S., but it's also about the manufacturing partnerships. There's a deal that shows that anywhere between 70 to 75 percent of products that are or parts manufactured in the U.S. taken into Mexico uh, in the assembly line uh, have no tariffs on them. And so that relationship runs deep, especially in the areas like um, the automotive industry or uh, electronic parts. So and as as I understand it, Though the, sh the shift has been rapid, the seeds were planted years ago. So I have a twofold question. Like, what are the factors that have led to this, and did the pandemic accelerate it? Yes, absolutely. Well, in 2018, we saw uh, tariffs being increased uh, on China. Until this day, about 66 
percent of Chinese exports into the U.S. are subject to tariffs of as high as 19 19 percent. Mm. China retaliated and put tariffs on the U.S. Um, uh, for as high as a uh, 21 percent. So you're looking at really sky high tariffs. These are double the amount of tariffs that countries part of the World Trade Organizations pay. The average tariff internationally is at 9%. So when those tariffs went sky high, of course, that's going to be a natural sort of free market force moving to where tariffs are going to be lower. But then, you know, China had the toughest lockdown policies during COVID, which really halted its manufacturing sector and supply chain issues. So, you know, this has been a long time coming. Um, and I, was, I, I can't find the word sort of a, it's sort of a new word uh, in regards to supply chains and trying to keep them closer the, rather than further away. And that was something that the pandemic sort of brought to light. So I want to ask you if this is a shift that we're seeing, you know, beyond the U.S., we're seeing maybe a shift globally. Yeah, it's nearshoring. So there when you're you sort of trading with a country closer to you and, you know, did the pandemic do some of this? Yes, it did. When we saw issues with supply chains, you know, ships going across the world to ship things, but also it's the Amazon Prime effect. It's called the Amazon Prime effect because, you know, as we start to order things online, we want things sometimes shipped the same day or next day. And so, when it comes to things um, like electronics and bigger products, it's a lot easier to just trade with a country closer to you. And also we think about climate change as well. Um, when you're not using all that fuel and those ships going across the world to deliver all these goods and services, it is a lot uh, more efficient and quicker. Mm -hmm. uh, Layla, great talking to you. All right, some really interesting stuff there. Mm. But that does it for Money Watch this week. And in the week ahead, finance ministers and central bank governors will gather in India for the G20 meeting. We're going to break down the issues and have the key takeaway from those talks. Yep. You are streaming CBS News, always on.